Why Congress? Phil Wallach argues that the U.S. has no other choice. We must find ways to accommodate each other, writes Phil, in addressing the biggest problems of the day, and Congress is the place we must do it. In this conversation, we'll explore some central contradictions of America's legislative branch, take a whirlwind tour through history on how these tensions have manifested over the past 200 years, and explore what it might take for a new legislative spring to blossom on Capitol Hill. Phil, welcome so much to China Talk. Thanks for having me. Phil, what are the origins of representative government? So I found I had to ask myself that question because even though I'm somebody who studies Congress for a living, I, I just sort of had a hard time pulling that out of any part of my education. It's not really something we learn about because it happened a long, long time ago. It kind of doesn't make it into your modern European history class that you take in school. It's something that happened over a long time in England in the 11th and 12th, 13th and 14th centuries. You have, you know, an institution of the king's advisors getting together to give them give him advice and eventually you sort of regularize that process and make sure you're pulling advisors from all the different parts of the land and uh, you start to sort of say oh well we don't need everyone there all the time it's, it's hard to travel back then so it's nice to have only some people on hand sometimes and, and over time you get this institution of if the king wants to raise taxes he has to consult with these advisors, and, and it becomes more and more regularized over time until you are, in fact, calling parliament, and eventually you have sort of the House of Commons emerge as its own institution where you're drawing from not just the titled lords, uh, but, but from the rising economic classes in England. So that happened sort of in the mists of time as far as anybody in the, in the present day or even at the American founding was concerned. Um, but but it, it's sort of a really important background point to understand that representative government is a totally different institution than democracy. The way that this emerged was was not like we all sort of decided that the vote voting was very important and we had people vote and more and more people got to vote over time. No, that isn't it. The way that these people came to be the king's advisors in the first place was not really democratic in any sense that we would recognize. So... Representative government sort of solved the problem of how to get the diverse views of the realm heard in the capital and became sort of a, a guarantee of, of not slighting any part of the country. So th that's, that's where it comes from long ago in England. And it sort of became just part of the fabric of society for the English colonists who came over to America. Yeah, and then it got awkward because those American colonists didn't necessarily feel like they had that representation. Um, we get a revolution, and then these guys come together and try to sort of remake a better version of that. So what did they, what lessons did the founders take from that story? And, you know, what were some, I guess, early competing visions of the role that a representative legislature should play? Yeah, so they had representative institutions as colonists in their, in their own places, that sort of became very influential in part because the crown from across the ocean really had a hard time directing anything. Uh, the Chinese proverb is rattling around in my head, right? The, the mountain is high and the emperor is far away. Uh, I, I think the colonists had these representative institutions stateside uh, on the west side, western half of the Atlantic that worked pretty well, and they were more and more frustrated that they had no representation in parliament back in London. So... They, they came to think that it's getting every group its, its representation in their new country was sort of the most important thing. The nature of representation was one of the things they fought most about it in the, in the 1770s and leading up to the Constitution in, in 1787. So we have, we, have a, we have a revolution, we have independence, Articles of Feder Confederation, we'll skip that. Um, now um, there's a government with a president and a legislature. A really interesting sort of theme which begins in your book all the way back in 1795 is you have Hamilton in the Treasury Department just being like, oh, I got these plans, give me the money. And Congress all of a sudden says, wait. I'm not so sure that we're cool just kind of taking budgets from you and, and running with it. And in 1795, the House permanently establishes its Ways and Means Committee as a sort of way to create, I guess, institutional knowledge and like a counterweight to the, um, uh, the Treasury Department. What, what, what were other dynamics that emerged very early in the Republic, which you end up seeing playing out over hundreds of years? 
In order to have this representation from all the diverse parts of the country actually work, you have to somehow organize the legislature. Otherwise, it's kind of chaos and you sort of let whatever outside group is most well organized come in and, and dominate in various ways. So the actual impetus for the creation of, of the first political party that, that Thomas Jefferson and James Madison uh, set up was anxiety about the National Bank and Hamilton and his well-connected buddies coming in and, and basically dominating the place, giving out favors to the legislators. And they needed to reorganize on Republican lines so that they would actually be working toward the common good for the common man in America. Is, is that, was, that was the line they, they took why they needed to organize the parties. So from the very beginning, you see kind of a struggle to bring some order to this. You, you always want it to be a place where diversity flourishes. You can't just reduce it all to one man, even though it would, it would be convenient to do that, to negotiate with the White House sometimes. But you, you have to have enough organization that the place doesn't just fall to pieces. Yeah, I like this line. Madison wrote to his friend and ally, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, that, quote, stock jobbers were becoming the praetorian band of government, at once its tool and its tyrant, bribed by its largesses and overawing it by clamors and combinations, because that's how you write letters. Uh, but anyway, so, okay, so, Phil, so you end up sort of highlighting two uh, streams of thinking about how the legislature should work. Um, let's start with the Madisonian vision of Congress. Okay, so this really goes back to something you probably did encounter in, in civics classes if you're an American, the famous Federalist Number 10. And this is a question of how we deal with faction. And Madison's vision is that we have an extended republic, a large and diverse country. And so by putting all these factions into contact with each other, sort of mixing it up, we ensure that no one of them dominates. Uh, and, and we basically find a way to pursue the common good through this clash of interests and clash of visions of, of the good. That's, that's the Madisonian vision, but it can have this problem of, of seeming very chaotic. And so from, from the very beginning, you have the sort of need to bring more order. And that culminates in what I call the Wilsonian vision after Woodrow Wilson, who well before he ever became the governor of New Jersey or the president of the United States was, was sort of the most famous academic commentator about Congress in America. And Wilson's anxieties were that Congress was so decentralized that it was just sort of a playground for interests. And the only way you could really get the government to aim at big, important things was to stamp out the parochial tendencies of Congress by sort of strong leadership at the top that would get everyone on the same page, that would make each party accountable to the voters by clearly differentiating what each party was about and then having the president and Congress work very closely together to implement sort of a coherent policy program. Yeah, I like this line from, from Wilson. He laments of American parties in 1885 that they are like armies without officers engaged upon a campaign which has no great cause at its back. Their names and traditions, not their hopes and policy, keep them together, which is like, you know, the kind of cognitive dissonance that your whole book is actually sort of arguing for in a weird way. The mess can actually be really useful. In, in one of your 20th century case studies of Congress during World War II, the sort of conventional narrative is that Congress was like isolationist to a fault in the 1930s, which helped Hitler and, and, and Mussolini rise, and then sort of very belatedly did Lend-Lease, and once the war started, basically gave FDR everything he wanted and more, and it was the executive branch that really ended up doing all the real work to um, uh, defeat uh, Japan and uh, Nazi Germany. Okay, so Americans were very down on war following the experience of World War I. They, they, they really thought that the country had sacrificed a lot in terms of the, the health and lives of, of the young men that got sent over and accomplished very little. Sort of Europe seemed to still be a mess after American intervention. And of course, people could tell that in many ways that, that the peace was unsatisfactory and contributing to the, the troubles that were developing in, in the ensuing decades. So Americans needed to be brought into war sort of by steps. And Congress certainly was Re representative of their reluctance. So 
there, there's some truth to the sense that, that the isolationism that was strong in Congress was an obstacle to, to Franklin Roosevelt sort of getting America more involved with its allies earlier on. But what people don't think about when they think about World War II is sort of how did, the, how did America stay together? How did we keep from falling to pieces on the home front? And so certainly Congress was not directing the generals and how to, how to push for victory in, in Europe or the Pacific. What it did do was take up some of the most difficult, thorniest problems of how to share the load of the war. So huge amounts of taxation as never before, huge inflation, rationing, all these things the American people did not always bear so cheerfully. And so Congress was really the place where we figured out how do we share the pain? What do we do to make it so ordinary Americans feel that this is being done fairly? Because there was a whole lot of anxiety about war profiteering. And it was really attentive to all those things. And it took on Roosevelt in really a surprising number of cases, especially after 1942, conservatives were pretty strong in Congress. Can we stay on that election for a second? I'm kind of amazed that like he lost a lot of seats in 1942. Did, did you read much about the about the dynamics that were going on then? Yeah, I think it's an interesting moment. I mean, Republicans had a pretty good year in 1944 also, um, when obviously they, they did not win the White House, but they were really positioning themselves as, as sort of a, um, a moderating influence. They weren't sort of going all out saying Roosevelt's is doing the wrong thing, we need to get out of the war or anything like that. They were saying, we need to conduct the war effort in a way that's better for Americans and we need to be careful of some of the sort of socialist tendencies that are gaining ground in the White House as we wage this war. We need to make sure that it's American values that we're going to fight for and that are going to win out after the war. Um, and that was a message that resonated with a lot of voters. Um, so it's an interesting moment for the Republican Party, um, sort of before it becomes sort of clearly a small government bunch. It's more, more of a, a business party, definitely fighting against a lot of the New Deal developments that, that it saw as pernicious and, and, and successfully fighting against some of Roosevelt's more ambitious plans to transform the American economy permanently, which maybe people don't even remember today. Yeah, I mean, I guess there was this this argument that you make is like Congress's role um, sort of before the war and once the war started was actually in making sure that the federal government's policies are more likely to keep the American people on board and and sort of OK with all the, uh, you know, uh, change and sacrifice that 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 had to happen in order to, um, uh, uh, you know, build up the industrial base and, 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 and you know, send people to uh, send people to die all, all across the world. And, you know, if it if it was coupled with sort of more ambitious dreams or more, you know, more aggressive taxation or, you know, this sort of like idea of of a civil of a civilian manpower draft where the sort of government ended up allocating human capital across uh, across the economy, not just within the military, then maybe you would have started to see um, more unrest, I guess, within um, uh, within the, the nation at large. Yeah, I mean, logically, this idea of a manpower draft seems to make a lot of sense. I mean, if if the country can force you from your home and send you overseas at, to, to fight and possibly die, why can't they pull you from your home and put you in a factory to help make the war material we need to win the war. Sounds, sounds like it makes a lot of sense and it was a very popular idea at the time, but, but conservatives in Congress sort of slowed it down and, and made people focus on how exactly is this going to work? How is this going to permanently change the fabric of American society if the government gets to tell you that you have to become an employee at a private establishment? That's a pretty fundamental change in, in what it means to be a citizen. And so I think luckily for us, conservatives sort of slow walked that and eventually killed, killed that idea. Um, and we, of course, were able to win the war with, without having resorted to it. Yeah. So, so another, another interesting dynamic was the level of trust that the congressional and um, executive branches were able to build up in one another. Um, you know, you did have these sort of investigations famously headed by Harry Truman looking into, you know, the, the World War II equivalent of waste, fraud and abuse. But um, also, you know, you had times like with the Manhattan Project, 
where the uh, the executive was basically like, look, we need this money. It's really important. We're not going to tell you <laughs> what it's for, but it could win us the war. And Congress was basically like, OK, so so what what sort of led the legislators you know, to decide to be okay with, with that sort of an arrangement. It's a very impressive thing. I mean, actually, the Truman Commission itself got a lot of complaints call, you know, sent in to, to, to investigate from people who worked in these strange factories and they didn't understand what the factories were doing. And they said, I don't, maybe these people are just bilking the government for money. I, I'm worried. And they investigated enough to ask some questions in the executive branch and be told, these people are working at factories on a super weapon that's going to help America win the war back off. And they said, OK, that was enough for them back then. I mean, it's kind of a symptom of trust as much as any part of a sort of cause, right? Sort of the system was functioning very well. The senators took each other at their word, even across party lines, that if, if you say this is, this is absolutely necessary to win the war and secrecy is important to winning the war, we can live with that. We can funnel some money Toward, and it was, a, it was a huge amount of money that went into making the atomic bomb. Just thousands and tens of thousands of people involved in creating the fissile material. And it worked because there was enough trust, uh, because the executive branch kn knew how to sort of build the ties with Congress uh, on that front. And, and the congressmen sort of were able to get enough access and, and sort of talk amongst themselves behind the scenes to decide that this was, this was all right. All right, so let's come to the civil rights movement. Um, you know, there is, I think, another sort of conventional narrative, perhaps typified by Robert Caro's um, LBJ ring cycle, um, which basically goes that, you know, the, it's really nice. There were all these activists who were uh, kind of doing their thing. And then um, uh, Kennedy was sort of waffling. Um, he, he gets assassinated, and then LBJ sees this as an opportunity and then uses all his you know, magical powers of persuasion to do the thing that no one has been able to do besides him in, in, in 1957 of, of passing real um, civil rights legislation. You argue um, in a fascinating chapter that this was in fact not the case and um, a softer, I guess, like more almost inclusive way of, of, of building and manifesting a coalition to um, a pass to civil rights and later voting rights was actually what finally got um, civil rights legislation over the hump in 1964. Yeah, I think pretty much every part of the of the conventional myth is nonsense. I mean, it's, it's certainly not the case that Johnson was not helpful to passing civil rights. He, he was in a, in a lot of ways, but he had this vision of how government can work and how the exercise of power ought to be. And we have this famous idea of him sort of looming and up next to people and just his physical presence somehow getting them to vote how he wanted them to. But that really, you know, he had been the Senate Majority Leader and, and made a hard push for civil rights in 1957. He got a very watered down bill because he ended up compromising with, with most, of, most of the Southerners there and that was all they would tolerate. That was, that was something that had not been done in, a, in more many generations. So that it was, it was not a nothing accomplishment, but it, it didn't actually move the needle that much. You know, John, Johnson then, you know, gets, gets himself the vice presidency, a job that he hates because he's sort of effectively on the sideline. The Kennedy administration, I guess that part of the myth is true enough. They're, they're sort of dragging their feet in some ways. They, they sort of decide, well, it's good we won the election. And even though we said we were sort of for a big revolution in civil rights, we've got lots of other priorities and need to work with these Southerners, so let's do that. But uh, the, the, the pressure for actually moving legislation really builds in Congress itself. And it's surprisingly bipartisan. There, you know, a lot of liberal Republicans in Congress back then who become aggressive champions of a civil rights legislation and, and, and in fact push legislation that the White House is, is worried is just much too aggressive. Um, uh, John Lindsay, who would become the mayor of New York later, is, is one of those members of Congress back then. So there's a lot of competition between the parties to see who can be the champion of civil rights. Of course, the Southern Democrats are never getting on board with that. But there's a lot of pressure building in Congress. Um, Kennedy gets assassinated. Johnson is the president. He thinks the way to capitalize on this moment which he understands is sort of an exceptional moment in American history, given the outpouring of sentiment for the dead, dead president, is to make a big push. And he kind of envisions 
his way of doing it, right? Pushing, pushing people around. But his successor as the Senate Majority Leader is a guy named Mike Mansfield, a really fascinating member of Congress, someone whose background just be hard to imagine in politics today. He, he was sort of a, a wayward youth who joined the Army and the Navy and the Marines in succession and uh, became sort of a, a copper miner for a time in Montana, where he was from. His wife pushes him to go back to school and he becomes a professor and eventually runs for Congress. Um, he was a big Pacific guy uh, throughout, throughout his career, eventually important foreign policy influence as an ambassador uh, to Japan. So Mansfield's whole disposition was just completely different from Johnson's. He was somebody who really believed in sort of the dignity of the fellow members of Congress, the importance of, of, of working with them, of letting them have their say, letting the deliberative process play out. And, you know, on a lot of issues that made people pretty frustrated with him. It seemed like he wasn't getting the progress they wanted, but it positioned him really well on civil rights to design a way that the Senate was going to work through this and actually get to the finish line with a strong bill. And that wasn't going to mean bringing the Southern Democrats on board, but it was going to mean figuring out a process that they could live with, that, that, that they felt gave them a fair shot to state their case and that they would live with the results of at the end of the day. So that's how we got the sort of the dynamics of, of this very long filibuster in the, in the summer of 1964. And it's sort of one of the most dramatic moments uh, of American policymaking in the 20th century. And the remarkable thing is how both sides managed to sort of maintain good relations throughout that. They, they were certainly calling each other plenty of names in their speeches on the Senate floor, but you know, that's what their sole, Senate's full, sole focus. We didn't do filibusters back then the way we do them now. It wasn't that, oh, this is filibustered, let's go do other things. No, it was, a, here's a filibuster. This is what we're gonna spend all our time on and nothing else until it's done. So it really focused the nation's attention on the issue. It forced the proponents of civil rights to make their case to the nation, and they were incredibly successful at that, building out a coalition that included pretty much everybody except the Southerners, especially this outreach through churches, not just in Southern churches, but in sort of Northern Midwestern conservative communities where you really got people to buy into the idea that this was this was sort of the big justice issue of our time and you had to get on the right side of this issue. Um, that's something that the dynamics of Congress actually forced to happen to play out that, that effort at persuasion. And, um, you know, in the end, that's, that's what assembled a coalition capable of breaking the filibuster in the Senate and, and got us a law that, that wouldn't just pass and get reversed the next time the party switch, but would pass and endure uh, for, for decades. You know, it, it's really interesting. There's sort of two two threads here. First, this idea that like, um, you know, you need this national groundswell of you know all the activists and 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 everyone writing their congressperson and the march on Washington and 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 everything else in order to get even close to creating your legislative majority. And then you have a filibuster where you focus the nation for a long time, and hopefully, you know, your midwestern church going representative ends up, you know, being pointed over the edge by um, by this uh, national conversation. But the other the other dynamic, which I thought was really interesting that Mansfield understood was that you almost needed to give the losers like dignity in defeat if you wanted them to be able to, you know, ultimately internalize that they lost and they weren't going to win later and and have it turn around. And, you know, you, you have this line where, you know, like, the people he's letting, he's giving dignity and defeat to are like awful, right? I mean, these are like the Americans that are most committed and were all elected in order to preserve segregation. And through this like incredible Yoda magic trick, he is able to uh, kind of diffuse what didn't happen in 1861 and what didn't happen in 2021, uh, where the leaders of the losers go back to their constituencies and say, look, we lost this is the law of the land, you know, we got to get over ourselves and sort of move forward. And it wasn't necessarily a given that that's how, that's how Jim Crow would necessarily have ended. Right. So it's interesting that you say these worst terrible people, right? I, I think that, I think that it's so easy to sort of turn history into a cartoon with the bad guys 
and and he did this jujitsu to neutralize the bad guys. But I th I think the important thing was that he really didn't think of them that way. Yeah, you know he that they, they really thought of each other as as dignified, worth worthy human beings whose positions had to be respected, and they had a huge divide. And yeah, ultimately, the liberals of the moment back then really did believe that the segregationists were committed to a just a, a backward and terrible moral system. But they didn't doubt their sincerity, and they didn't think that that just made them sort of awful human beings full stop. That They were their coalition partners. They were members of the Democratic Party together, and they needed to make government work, and they, they had all kinds of commonalities on other things. I mean, Richard Russell, um, the, the sort of leader of the, of, the, of the segregationists, he's the architect of the school lunches program. He's somebody who had lots of disagreements with Franklin Roosevelt, but was also a, a sort of important backer of some New Deal initiatives. So it's, it's complicated, and the process is meant to sort of let them fight it out on this issue, let them have their say, let their section, the South, feel like it wasn't just bulldozed, but was actually given the chance to make its case. And then at the end of the day to say, yes, we made your case, we lost, and now we have to follow the law of the land. The, the way LBJ wanted to do that was just like, uh, what, what did Trump say about like a, a North Korea and Iran? Like maximum pressure, you know, make them stay up 24 hours a day and, and just sort of do this, do this in the most testosterone filled way possible. But you had Mansfield who took this, as you would say, like understanding approach or empathetic approach to the you know, plight that the Southern, uh, the Southern Democrats were in. And, uh, you know, you had, you quoted a, um, uh, a, another historian, Zelitzer, um, who said that, uh, Mansfield thought it was important to give his democratic colleagues, quote, their dramatic last stand. So they could demonstrate to their constituent constituents that they understood and shared their opposition to the bill. He didn't want to destroy the Southerners. He knew that when Congress moved beyond civil rights, their votes, their votes could be useful to the democratic party. And, you know, that is like, a you know, as, as you said, like I, I, the way I framed it was very much in a, in a sort of good versus evil valence, which is, you know, hard to take out in the context of thinking about, uh, thinking about civil rights legislation and, you know, Throm, Strom Thurmond and whatnot. But like, it did end up that, that method did end up getting results and, you know, it's not perfect, but I think, I think, um, uh, the second half of the 20th century would have been a lot uglier if you ended up having a more, aggressive kind of response against uh, against integration than you ended up than you ended up seeing in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, I, I think it's important that the civil rights leaders themselves were very much on board with, with this strategy and um, they, they, they wanted to win an enduring victory. They, they, they didn't want to just figure out the fastest way to get 51 percent and change the rules and see what they could grab today. I, I mean, they really did appreciate the, the importance of, of running through the process. Um, one of my favorite moments in the book is, is sort of this amazing act of magnanimity from uh, Clarence Mitchell, who was the chief lobbyist of the NAACP. Um, so after the cloture vote has been won, Mitchell actually walks Richard Russell back to his Senate office uh, and sort of he, he's, he's feeling compassion for his defeated foe. And Russell turns to him and said, you should be grateful for the filibuster because that actually ensured that the Civil Rights Act is going to, is going to endure and the South would never have accepted it if, if we hadn't had our chance to, to, to fight and to sort of lay ourselves on the line for this stand against this bill. And I think a lot of people would think, oh, that's just nonsense. Obstruction is terrible. What a what a what a story to tell yourself. But I, I really I think that actually he was he he really had the right idea. By it's by working our working through the democratic process in our representative legislature that you actually get policies that that stick and sort of are able to affect the fabric of our society rather than just sort of becoming little policy changes that the next administration reverses. Yeah, there's something like biblical or like Homeric about representative democracy. 
Um, and you know, that, that, that scene where, you know, you, you elect these champions, right. Who are supposed to like be your manifestation and, you know, the David and Goliath or the Achilles and Hector or, and like, you know, they do battle and one wins and one loses. And then sometimes like, okay, you can settle the war based on that. Um, because people have like, you know, bought into this idea that they're connected with this champion enough to be able to put down their swords once <laughs> Well, I don't think that worked out too well for the Trojans, but let's put, the, put that aside. <laughs> Anyways, um, there's something to that, though. This is uh, maybe, your, maybe your next book, Bill. All right, let's get to the 70s, which is like a weird time for Congress. A lot of the sort of critiques of the 70s, the, the Hill in the 70s, are, are pretty foreign to folks today. So what, um, uh, what worked and what didn't in that era? Okay, so kind of after civil rights, in that moment, you still have sort of rising liberals sort of feeling their oats and feeling like the continued influence of, of these Southern conservatives is really irksome to them. So they wanted to change the, change the rules to give themselves more power and, and these super senior Southerners less power. So there's all kinds of decentralizing reforms pushed through Congress in the 70s. And there's a huge explosion of, of congressional staff and the, the sort of, especially in the House, the overall picture that emerges is one of a little bit of chaos, but sub subcommittee government is what political scientists called it. It's sort of where many, many dozens of members have their own subcommittees and are kind of making things happen. They're not necessarily passing laws, but they're doing a lot of oversight. They're gener generating a lot of excitement. They're sort of channeling the, the desires of a lot of these up, up and coming liberal constituencies. So yeah, it, it's just, a, it's an impressive an impressive amount of change for this institution that had been a very hidebound place, especially in the 50s, Congress was seen as this sort of clubby institution where you sort of, all the members had to adhere to these very sort of strict social norms. And a lot of the younger members in the 70s sort of blow that open. There's this huge influx of freshman members in 1974 as the Nixon administration has imploded because of, of Watergate. So you, you see just huge changes and um, it's sort of a, a body that's, that's alive with possibilities, but it, it doesn't, all, doesn't all go that well in the end. There's this interesting dynamic that you talk about of like Congress investing in itself and its own sort of institutional knowledge. And um, uh, sort of, you know, after Nixon, there was obviously a lot of skepticism about the, the executive branch, you know, pulling pulling the wool over the eyes of, of the legislative branch and kind of, you know, you know, not spending money that it appropriated and, and doing secret stuff that wasn't cool with. And, you know, this this dynamic that we talked about earlier in the show, all the way back to Congress not trusting Hamilton in the Treasury Department kind of comes out again, where you have this, you know, um, you know, you have the creation of the Office of Technology Assessment and the Congressional Research Service and all of these sort of, uh, you know, all this headcount uh, in order to put the legislative branch on a more equal playing field when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to the executives and the and, you know, the lobbies uh, and, and the lobbyists that are coming in. Can we talk a little bit about sort of like the ebb and flow of that and what what more staff does and doesn't gives you doesn't doesn't give you as a um, uh, as a legislative body? Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't just it wasn't just Nixon. Uh, it, it was Johnson before him as well that Congress felt was was really running over them, especially on spending matters. And I think especially in regard to Vietnam, I think Vietnam really did transform American politics. And that used to be really obvious to everybody. Maybe, maybe younger people today don't always appreciate just how impactful it was uh, in eroding this trust we used to have in our, in our leaders. But Congress tries to build itself up. So it builds a, a congressional budget office so that it's not just having to take the numbers that come from the Office of Management and Budget, that it actually has its own numbers to work with. It builds up huge staff capacity in the congressional committees such that they can try to permanently scrutinize what executive branch agencies are up to and sort of not be just sort of episodically reacting to things. So what does that get you and what does it not get you? I, I think it gets you a sense that you really are paying attention and there's a lot of interest groups that find that really rewarding, that, that sort of there's a continuous channel of influence that the legislature is working on the 
affairs of the executive branch. But uh, what it doesn't necessarily get you is, is the sort of magic of legislation, right? There's, there's sort of the stars have to align is sort of the lazy way of talking about how legislation comes about. But it actually takes some kind of building coalitions. That work requires members to come in contact with each other. And so one of the hazards of building up staff so much is that if you try to work through the staff too much, members are actually encountering each other less. They're sort of less able to work the magic of politics and create coalitions of strange bedfellows. Over time, they become less trusting of each other as potential negotiating partners. So there, there were already those problems beginning to be seen by the end of the 1970s. A uh, great book published out of, out of AEI at that time uh, was called Unelected Representatives, and it was sort of all about the crazy power that, that Hill staff were, were exercising, kind of a new phenomenon back then. And so you, you kind of have the sense that we've built up the staff and we have an impressive amount of action going on, but it doesn't always end up translating into, into focused legislation. Okay, so another interesting thing is like how technology ends up changing Congress. Can you talk a little bit about electronic voting and how that sort of changes dynamics in Congress? Yeah, it's, it seems like a little thing, but it, it does matter because if you're taking votes electronically, uh, you can take a lot more votes faster. And you can put people on the record basically without a cost in time. So Congress used to do a lot more in the Committee of the Whole. This is kind of this mysterious thing where the House of Representatives says, instead of being the actual House of Representatives, we're going to be all the same people, but meeting as the Committee of the Whole. And we're going to be sort of more flexible in working out the details of legislation in, in the form of this committee. And then we're going to go back to a, wearing our official hats. And there's actually a mace that they have in the chamber. If the mace is up, they're the real House of Representatives. The mace is down, they're the Committee of the Whole. There's something medieval still about, about our government uh, even today. So... Uh, we used to do a lot more in the Committee of the Whole at taking, taking unrecorded votes. You could, you could do that just on, on voice votes, but you could also do it as unrecorded teller votes, they were called. Everyone comes up and casts their vote, and they're counted, uh, and, and nobody ever gets to know who voted which way. And that just drove transparency advocates crazy. How, how were we not going to be able to hold our representatives accountable for what they're voting in Congress? They thought this was terrible. Uh, and so eventually, with the help of electronic voting, we pretty much drove this practice into extinction. And we take a lot more votes, and people are on the record a lot more. They're more accountable to their voters. Now, is that a good thing? Well, arguably, the people who are going to be most able to take advantage of that transparency are the interest groups themselves. So transparency is a big winner in the 1970s. And... There's definitely more theoretical ability to hold people accountable, and maybe that should make government work better, but it's not always so clear that sort of the common good uh, understood broadly really ends up being uh, the beneficiary of this added transparency. Oftentimes it is special interests who, who do the most with it. Let's take us through the present. So briefly in the, in the sort of uh, uh, 90s, we have, a, uh, we have the, the Gingrich Revolution, Congress like uninvests in itself. Phil, very briefly, um, take, us from, take us from the 1980s to the present. Okay, so you had this sort of sense that Congress was a bit of a, a mess because of all the exciting changes of the 70s. From the mid 80s onward, you see a tendency towards centralization. You see this Wilsonian tendency that we talked about earlier reasserting itself, the need to get everyone on the same page. And you see Democrats, uh, embracing this trend, especially under the speakership of Jim Wright. That makes Republicans really angry as they feel like they're being completely kept in the cold. And that, that accounts for the rise of Newt Gingrich as, as somebody who comes in and says, the way that the Democrats are running Congress, it's totally corrupt. We need to campaign against this terrible institution. And then once we get control of it, we need to smash it up and reinvent it in our own image. And Gingrich leads, you know, helps lead Republicans to their first control of the House of Representatives in 40 years after the 1994 midterms. And they do a fair amount of smashing the place up to, to reinvent it. But they continue to embrace centralization. One of the main arguments of the book is that Gingrich doesn't really have a legislator's sensibility. 
he's got this mandate idea. The American people have sent him. He gave them this contract with America. He wants to turn everything on its head, get rid of the great society, get Bill Clinton dancing to his tune. And he thinks that's sort of what the election meant. He ends up very disappointed in a lot of that. This model of a centralized leadership sort of dominating the agenda of Congress and, and sort of seeking, seeking partisan confrontation for its own sake uh, and for the sake of sort of framing the next election, that becomes the dominant model in the, in the 1990s and then into the 21st century. People who have just been following politics for the last decade, I think, might have the sense that it's just always been a place of nasty partisan warfare. Uh, and that's forgivable because it really has been that way for quite a while now. Um, both parties have, have embraced this model. Nancy Pelosi was a very sharp-elbowed speaker who prioritized political conflict in, in her own fashion. You know, I think it's just really important to understand there were times when Congress worked in a very different way. If members on Capitol Hill today wanted it to look a different way, wanted to organize things differently, they absolutely could. Uh, the, the tools are there at their disposal, and we the voters should be rooting for them to sort of reinvent the place. Yeah, so, so you paint three kind of like visions of the future. The first one, you just have a basically like current trends of the, the executive branch does executive branch things. And then the legislature, the judiciary ends up deciding whether they can or can't. And you have a lot of policy shifts based on um, uh, uh, based on who's who's president and then what the uh, Supreme Court and appellate courts look like. Um, then you have sort of vision number two of Congress kind of like weirdly gets out of the way and ends up just being a an increasingly irrelevant body that doesn't do that sort of kind of like national conversation, hard discussion, like big compromise on, you know, big coalition finding on, on big issues uh, work that we talked about during uh, World War II and um, uh, uh, the civil uh, in the civil rights movement kind of just like lets the executive do whatever it wants. And then this this third vision, I'll let you uh, explain for yourself. So what does that end up, what, what, what's the, the dream of, of what we can look back at 2050 of Congress having turned itself into? Right, so thanks for letting me tell you the names, which I'm so pleased about, of these, these things for myself. The first one that you sort of current trend lines is, that's decrepitude. That's where Congress is headed, uh, to become a marginalized body that sort of lobs a bunch of insults around, but everyone understands that the real work of government is happening in the executive branch and, and to a lesser extent in the courts. You know, I say that that's, it's, it's sort of heading toward what legislatures do in authoritarian countries. You have, you have legislatures in every country in the world today, pretty much, and they, they get together and talk about things, but in the authoritarian countries, people understand it's just a lot of hot air being pushed around or it's sort of useful to the regime. There's, there's a lot of different visions of how a representative assembly can work. You know, you can have a body that really draws in people from, from smaller and smaller districts. There's a lot of people who want to make the House of Representatives very big today as a way of, of, of accommodating the population growth that the United States has had. So I, I'm nervous about that, to be honest. You look at something like the People's Congress in China, this is an institution not everyone knows about, but it's more than 3,000 members from around the country come together, and technically they pass all the laws in China. But it's like a small committee of a committee that actually does the work of, of writing those laws. And of course, all of this is essentially run out of the hip pocket of, of the one ruling party there. But you can have a lot of people talking and a lot of people coming in sort of getting their fingerprints on it as a tool to try to legitimate what's happening in the centralized government without it actually having all that much impact or, or determining the outcome. Uh, you know, so if, if, if America is sort of losing its sense of, of, of how to do self-government, uh, that doesn't mean that we're going to stop having people talking in the halls of Congress. It's, an, it's a very nice building. We're going to keep having people come there and talking and, and giving tours to people who want to see the, the beautiful architecture. But the question is, like, whether this is actually the place where decisions are getting made. The big, the big decisions about sort of what's important to us as a country, where we should go, that's, that's, that's the essence of, of a politically free people. And the more, we, the more we sort of just say, oh, it's such a pain in the butt to let these people keep talking to each other the least we can do is sort of make sure that the executive branch gets to 
gets to do what it needs to do for the country and they can keep talking, but we're not going to let them matter much. That's, that's really a dangerous road for us to go down. That, that's what legislatures look like in authoritarian countries. That's what the People's Congress looks like in China. And uh, I'm very nervous that that sort of slow drift into that is what's ahead f for Congress in the United States. I'm, I'm afraid that's where America can be heading without reform. So what about reform? Reform can mean to a lot of people, let's figure out how Congress doesn't slow everything down, doesn't obstruct everything. Let's figure out how Congress can get on board with presidential agenda setting. So that's the scenario that I call rubber stamp. So making Congress more pliant to the wishes of the president such that we can have sort of a clearer lines of accountability in the old Wilsonian fashion. The president is pretty much in charge like a prime minister and Congress needs to get with, get with the program. The third scenario is revival. How can we get Congress to be a place of Madisonian factional conflict that leads to good compromises for the country? It takes, takes some imagination in the sort of fictional scenario that I lay out. It sort of takes a pretty severe crisis that, that sort of reshuffles the politics. And, and I imagine sort of an immigration crisis much worse than the one we have today being the tool, but I'm not not so confident in what, what it would actually be. We need, we need kind of a reshuffling of our political lines to go along with a reshuffling of how Congress thinks of itself and how, how the members think of whether it's more important to just posture for their party ahead of the next election or whether it's more important to actually push for policy, even if that means working across the lines. Uh, and in a way, it, seemed, it has seemed imminent to me for a long time that we need such a reshuffling and that surely members are going to be fed up with working in the kind of place that they're in now where really members are just reduced to sort of fundraisers and, and lever pullers. But I've been disappointed the last half a decade. You know, you might have thought a, a shock to the system of the magnitude of COVID might have, might have shaken things up. To a remarkable extent, it didn't. And, you know, so we'll see. We're, we're seeing generational change in Congress right now, right? A sort of a generation of, of very strong leaders who have been good at sharpening partisan conflict. Pelosi, we've mentioned, Mitch McConnell in the Senate is, is getting up there in years. So maybe the next, the next generation of, of, of members and of leaders will uh, see their way to making the institution work differently. Been COVID, could have been Donald Trump. <laughs> um, but um, uh, yeah, I guess we're still waiting for that, um, uh, that reset point. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an unfortunate thing to have to say, but like maybe a hot war with Russia or China, like could imagine those things pretty dramatically reshuffling people's commitments in American politics, but gosh, we n none of us can be rooting for that. Any concluding reading recommendations? Or, or uh, uh, yeah, so what, what have been the most uh, uh, interesting illustrative books you've come across about uh, Congress over the course of this uh, research? I want to actually recommend uh, a book by a, a British political scientist that isn't really about Congress, but that I think shaped my shaped my thinking a great deal. Uh, his name was Bernard Crick. His most famous book is probably a biography of George Orwell. He sort of got the official papers from the Orwell family uh, and wrote that book. But the book that influenced me is called In Defense of Politics. You know, politics is, is almost a dirty word in our culture today. To say that something is political just means it must come from base motives. I, you don't have politicians sort of proudly wearing that label uh, as a badge. They're sort of all embarrassed to be politicians, and they want to convince you that actually they're, they're something else uh, instead. But we need to understand politics as the way, we, the way we live with difference in our society. And Crick does just an amazing job of, of explaining the value of that, the value of, of believing in peaceful resolution of conflicts. Sort of social peace is kind of, a badly underrated phenomenon in our society because we've had so much of it in our country's history. Uh, you know, we had a civil war, but that was 150 years ago. And it's, it's not necessarily so obvious that all these different diverse groups can figure out ways of living together peacefully. Politics is the way we organize ourselves to make it so that, that we engage with each other without coming to blows. And Crick explains why you know, we can't substitute for that with technocracy or with, you know, utopian ideas like, like uh, one-party communism. For him, politics is sort of 
indispensable to what living in a free society is all about and, and, and to dealing with the fact of social difference. So that's the book I'd recommend. Awesome. One other question for you. So you make this point early in your book that presidents get a lot of movies made out of them and a lot of <laughs> books written about, you know, them and their cabinets and the big decisions they make. But, you know, it's you're hard pressed to find popular popular literature that really delves deep into, you know, Senate, uh, Senator House majority leaders and like legislative battles and whatnot. I'm curious, you know, if you if you if there are any characters you think really need a, um, a biography length treatment or, you know, what what Netflix, what HBO miniseries about some <laughs> legislative fight would you be really excited to see um, uh, see recorded? Yeah. So it's hard to make good stories about Congress. It's just it's so easy to tell stories about presidents, especially if you want to adopt the good and evil frame that that comes so naturally to us as storytellers. President fighting for good beats back unenlightened horde trying to drag their feet. That that's that's a narrative that we can apply pretty easily. It's harder to tell good stories about Congress. And, you know, you said legislative leaders, but what about member, you know, lesser members, uh, people, people who were just effective lawmakers? I have to admit that I've read a lot of biographies of these people, and they're not always such thrilling stories. Um, making, making things happen on Capitol Hill is kind of a mysterious art. It, it requires somebody who's good at maintaining a whole lot of relationships more than you can fit in comfortably into a book. With, with all their colleagues, even ones that they don't always vote the same way as. Uh, so if you read about like a really effective legislator like, let's say, Henry Waxman of California, it, it's hard to tell this as a thriller. It's somebody who's maintaining relationships over a long time, building dedicated knowledge on their staff over time that they can use to write legislation. Um, you know, there, there's all kinds of members who just are completely forgotten to obscurity, unfortunately. But, but who have this, this art of, of, of figuring out what's possible and making it happen. Barbara Conable of, of New York. People have, I'm sure most people have never heard of him. I read a very good biography of, of, of him. He was, he was at one point the ranking member of the Ways and Means Committee in the House and somebody who helped figure out how to save Social Security in 1983. So a lot of people labor in relative obscurity uh, and really make things happen. It is harder to tell stories about them, but we should at least sort of understand that this is a, this is a sort of a failure of our political imaginations, and, and we, should, we should all work a little harder to not, to, to not read that, in, that next marginal presidential biography and to try, to try to learn something about how things are working that comes at it from a different perspective. You know what would be really cool, which will never happen, is like Hard Knocks or um, uh, this sort of F1 type of Netflix coverage where they basically just follow, they have a camera crew and they follow someone around 24 seven. And I think, you know, the version of that, that goes into the locker room and, you know, goes into the gym and, and sort of shows you how someone uses that like social magic to, um, uh, you know, to maintain these relationships. Uh, I right. think that would be really compelling television, but like, you know, anyone who's good enough to, to be able to do that is not going to allow Netflix to, um, uh, to, to follow them around. I don't know. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, I like there, there's an old show called Brick City that followed Cory Booker around when he was the mayor of Newark. And it's interesting to watch him ply his craft at that stage of his career. Of course, yeah. he's, he's in the Senate now. You know, I, I think you have to be wary also because some of the members who are absolutely the best at publicity and self-promotion today are not sort of the typical members who actually know how to make things happen. They're the people who are most fo focused on making themselves famous. If you're, if you're good at this craft, you're the, exactly the kind of person who doesn't want the camera to follow you around. So Phil, we close every episode with a song. Is there like a song about Congress you like? Oh man, boy, you caught me off guard with that one. There's not that many songs about the presidents, even. My my little daughters have become preoccupied with a song that I just learned called "What Did Della Wear." That's that's a an amus an amusing bad pun filled tour of our of our of our United States. Uh, I can recommend that one for anyone wanting to get themselves some well earned groans. <laughs>